journey we've had. Yeah, we have. Um, it's quite a long and complex journey. Um, there's lots of medical um, jargon that we may use. Um, and when I say that Iona is one in a million, um, she definitely is. And as I tell you the story, you'll see why she's definitely one in a million in the medical term. Um, and obviously in the emotional term, she is definitely one in a million. So, um, so Iona was born um, 18 years ago. And at two days old, she was diagnosed with a condition called Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome is where she is missing an X chromosome. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's an issue, and, but it was manageable. Um, it can affect women, it only affects women, um, and it can affect women in many different ways. Um, there's, there's some commonalities with Turner syndrome. Generally, growth might be an issue, um, fertility. Um, sometimes they'll have problems with their heart, um, their hearing, um, the kidneys, urinary tract infections, uh, and, and, and many other issues. So it's, it can be quite a complex condition. Uh, but we, we, we were very much managing it and, and just getting on with life. Um, Iona did have a number of urinary tract infections, which um, she uh, was in hospital for. Um, and then they seemed to get on top of these urinary tract infections. And then it kind of then became lots and lots of ear infections. Um, they think sometimes that these infections are due to the fact that with Turner syndrome, maybe the tubes are just a little bit smaller, um, which, which is one theory. Um, but in Iona's case, unfortunately, her ear infections turned, in, turned into a more serious condition called a coleosteotoma. So a coleosteotoma is a very um, horrible growth in the inner ear, and it can um, strip out literally all the hearing bones within the inner ear. Um, so they had to do a CT scan to plan surgery for her um, coleosteotoma. Just had a thought. I'm going to oh, Iona's gone to get something, but that's fine. So, um, so when she was five, um, she had the CT scan um, because they have a facial nerve running very, very close to where they would be operating. So it was really important to get that um, that imaging um, of where they were going to be operating on. Um, so she went down for the CT scan, and within probably about. 30 minutes, um, the um, radiographer came to, to get us and said, look, there's no easy way to say this, but we need your consent for her to now go into an MRI scan uh, because we can see something in her brain. Um, and at that point, I'll be honest, I just thought it was probably just still connected to, to the ear. Um, but um, so then um, she went for the MRI scan and within an hour, um, this very lovely man in a three-piece suit came to see us and said, um, "I'm head of um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm head of neurosurgery here at Birmingham Children's Hospital, and unfortunately, Iona has a massive brain tumor." And we were very well. To be honest. I don't think we had, we, we had time to be shocked um, because it was just very, very factual then about what they think the brain tumour is. Uh, we need to operate next week. Um, literally go home for the weekend because that was on a Friday. Go home for the weekend um, and prepare and have a week, the weekend with your family um, and we'll be operating on Wednesday. Uh, will be in, she'll be in hospital on Tuesday, operating on Wednesday. So, um, so we had a nice weekends, as nice as we could. Um, and then we went to hospital on the Tuesday. They did all the preparation for her surgery. And then on Wednesday, she went, the Wednesday she went down for um, her operation. It was 10 hours it lasted, 10 hours of brain surgery. 
um, and um, then the brain the, the the brain surgeon came to see us. He was happy-ish about the way the operation had gone, um, except that he said, you know, he couldn't get all the tumor out. So he told us straight away then that there was that likelihood that it could um, grow again. Um, and the only thing they could do was perhaps radiotherapy, but they didn't want to do it because she was only five. Um, and obviously it's the fallout and consequences of that radiotherapy at such a young age in the developing brain. Um, so uh, the other issue with the, the site of where her tumor was, um, unfortunately, it took out her entire pituitary function. Um, so she was left um, panhypopituitary. So basically, she has to have lots of medication, um, hydrocortisone, thyroxin, uh, uh, growth hormone, uh, desmopressin. So there's a whole load of medications and, and issues just associated with being pan pituitary but you know as a family we we just tend to hit things very much head on and it's like okay give the problem give an issue let's find out all about it let's deal with it the best way we can um it, it's very strange actually because um straight away obviously with having a brain tumor it was okay so um what's out there in terms of supports and I was absolutely gobsmacked to know or find out, do you know, there wasn't a local support group. You know, we live in, in the West Midlands and there's no local support group for brain tumours. So, of course, that was an issue and it was like, OK, well, let's set one up then. Uh, and that's exactly what we did. And within six months to a year, um, we had set the, the first um, local um, brain tumour support group up with the help of the, the brain tumour charity. So that's how it got up and running. But unfortunately, as it got up and running, it coincided with Iona becoming ill again. Um, oh, and by the way, I ha I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. Um, unfortunately, after her brain surgery, the ENT surgeon then came to us and said, look, guys, I know you won't want to hear this, but, and I know she just had 10 hours of brain surgery, um, but as soon as she recovers from her brain surgery, so in about eight weeks time, we have to operate on the ear. It's, it's really important. So she was back in hospital. Um, that was, I think it was an eight hour operation on her ear because, because by that time, the cholesteatoma had become extensive um, to the point basically where she's deaf in this ear now. Um, so um, anyway, so she had that as well. Um, so um, unfortunately, um, it, about 18 months later, um, the tumour started to grow again. Um, and the only option we had was radiotherapy. Um, so in January 2009, she started a six week course of radiotherapy. And I suppose the hardest thing about that, although Iona, honestly, she, being so young, she was such a star, I have to say, because as a parent, I literally was, how on earth are we going to get through six weeks of radiotherapy every single day? under general anaesthetic, you know, it, it's how do we do that? But mm. we did, we just took it into little bite-sized chunks. Um, and of course, I think it's with other parents here. Um, of course, we had our other daughter to consider as well. And it was such a shame for her because she was only 12. Um, and obviously she was, she was facing her own issues with her sister being poorly. Um, but we had to um, expect our 12 year old to be able to get herself up in the morning, get her own breakfast, get, get, get to school herself and just maintain that normality. Um, and, and I have to say I'm very proud of both girls because, you know, they both just um, got through it, uh, got through it really well. 
I mean, Iona had her radiotherapy treatment under general anaesthetic every single day. We would come home, she'd have a little piece of toast, she'd put her school uniform on and we, she'd get to school. She was usually in school by midday, every day. So, um, so yeah, so, so we got through the six weeks of radiotherapy um, and then life, we just kind of got on with life. Unfortunately, the ears became very problematic. We think that may have been caused by the cholesteatomas um, not being able to maybe heal as well because of the radiotherapy. Um, and what happened was she developed further uh, cholesteatomas, not just in the ear they operated on, but in the other ear as well. So there were multiple complex operations on her ears. Uh, it resulted in her having a bone anchored hearing aid uh, being uh, implanted. Hang on, she wants to show you her see hearing I, aid. See if I can get it. Hang on, just put your you head up a bit. There you it is. Can you see it there? Yeah. Can you see it? <laughs> so that's £3,000 worth of processing just there. <laughs> um, so she's had her bone anchored hearing aids. Um, multiple operations on the ear um, and then um, 2018 uh, we were um, by accident actually this happened it was actually a, a scan result that her, EN, that her EMC surgeon had sent us about another operation on her ear and in this um, scan result it mentioned that the cavernomas appeared to be getting larger. And we sort of scratched our head and said, cavernomas? Um, this is the first time we've ever Hi. heard about a cavernoma. So we got in touch with um, the oncologist and actually what it turned out, it the and the neurosurgeon, it turned out that she had had these cavernomas identified by the radiographer in 2012 but we were never made aware of it we were never made aware of these cavernomas so um they explained the neurosurgeon was very very good obviously couldn't explain why we hadn't been told um but did a very good job in telling us about um cavernomas what they were uh where they were and basically that they were going to um watch it and, and wait um, which is what happens. Um, we, it's very hard with Iona to tell whether, you know, symptoms of fatigue or etc. are a result of the cavernoma or all her issues. Um, so, um, but what happened was in January this year, um, she had a massive seizure beginning tell of January. Julie yeah, and you'll be interested, Julie, in this. Um, because Iona, when she had her seizure, was on placements um, in a primary school because she was doing her two-year diploma because she in wants child to, care. in childcare because she wants to be a, a teaching assistant, um, and she had her seizure in school, and and of course that's caused problems trying to get a placement since because of the risk of seizures. So I can fully appreciate exactly what you must be going through with Hannah. Um, so she had her seizure in January. Um, she's been on uh, a lot of medication since. Um, she's had a number of seizures since, still not controlled. Um, and basically where we're at with the cavernomas, she's got four cavernomas apparently. The biggest one is in the right temporal lobe. That's the one that's given the most um, seizure activity. She's had two EEGs which uh, confirm um, the activity from the right temporal lobe is the one that's probably causing uh, the seizures. Um, they're still playing about with the medication. She last had a seizure about four weeks ago um, and then we've had to increase her medication and that's where we're at folks, that's her journey. <laughs> I mean, what I would say as a parent, um, and I fully, fully appreciate as a parent and also running a local support group, 
that every single person has a different way of dealing and coping with the situation. So I am not going to say that our way is the best way. It's just what works best for us as a family. Um, and definitely what has worked best for us is to hit things head on, is to find out as much as we can about um, the particular uh, issues. It is to try and gain a positive, if at all, from the situation that we're in. Um, and that's how we best cope as a family. So, um, but I can fully appreciate that that is not for everyone.